All right. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Emma Levine, who's the Associate Professor of Behavioral Science and the Charles E. Merrill Faculty Scholar at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Um, Emma studies the psychology of altruism, trust, ethical dilemmas. She'll speak with us today about honesty, harm, conflicts. Um, she publishes widely in psychology, organizational behavior, and marketing, really spanning a lot of fields. Uh, my pleasure to turn it over to Emma. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks so much for being here. I love being at this conference and it's already been so stimulating um, and I'm sure a lot of work will continue to come out of the conversations we've had uh, moving forward. So today I'm going to present uh, an overview of some of the work that I've been doing through the Templeton grant on difficult conversations and the values conflicts, particularly honesty harm conflicts that arise within them. So difficult conversations are obviously ubiquitous, and this is a common situation we face in which we struggle to be honest, right? So uh, difficult conversations might involve giving negative feedback or voicing controversial opinions or delivering negative news, whether that's conducting layoffs, uh, delivering negative health information, or even communicating to the public about uh, public health or some uh, impending emergency. And so uh, in this project, we wanted to understand kind of four main research questions about difficult conversations. Uh, the first being, what values conflict during them? Why are they difficult? Presumably, honesty is one value that's relevant, but what, what are we uh, experiencing conflict with honesty during these conversations? So I talked about uh, some of the work on that question last year, but I'll briefly review kind of the key insight today. And that leads to uh, the work we've done to answer question two, which is how are these conflicts then experienced and resolved? Uh, and I'll focus on our answers to that question today and begin to talk about how those conflicts differ across culture and context. Uh, so this is still in progress, but I'm gonna present some new data uh, on two different cross-cultural studies looking at difficult conversations uh, and also the beginning of some interventions to promote honesty within them. All right, so uh, I presented last year kind of what values are relevant. And uh, to answer this question, we did a bunch of descriptive studies with different populations, including politicians, physicians, lay people, both in the US uh, and in Hong Kong and China. And just to kind of highlight primarily what we find is that right across different samples, when you ask people, tell me a time you struggled to be honest, and you ask them, why did you struggle to be honest? You give them an opportunity to say what honesty conflicted with. They're primarily talking about or recalling situations that involve social harm, right? Either I felt honesty would conflict with uh, my duty to avoid harm to others or to care for others or to preserve social harmony. So I can talk more about the details of some of these studies as well as other ones, but I'll just begin today with the premise that many, maybe not all, but many of our difficult conversations involve this conflict between honesty and social harm. And so then we can begin to understand, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean for how this is experienced, how we resolve these conflicts? Uh, and to make some predictions there, I'm gonna build on some of my past work on the moral judgment of honesty and deception. So in uh, a paper published, I guess just a year ago, but that I'd been working on for a long time before that, uh, I look at how people make moral judgments of honesty and deception, and I find that uh, people rely on two main dimensions. So one is the instrumental value of truth, the degree to which they believe truth-telling will lead to meaningful growth and learning, and they're trading that off with the immediate harm of truth, the degree to which truth-telling would cause harm to the, to the person who's listening. And so in that work, I focused on this lower right-hand quadrant, uh, which is this quadrant of unnecessary harm. People believe it's ethical to lie when the truth lacks instrumental value but would cause immediate harm. People think it's ethical to tell the truth in all other quadrants. And so in the past, I've kind of unpacked this quadrant, but in kind of the work inspired by this grant, we've really been focused on now unpacking this quadrant which is the quadrant of difficult conversations. They're difficult because they involve a trade-off between causing immediate social harm and promoting growth and learning. And what's interesting is people think they should tell the truth in these conversations, right? If we look at this lower quadrant, this is actually not a difficult conversation. People think they should lie. There's not a tension there. 
But in the upper right hand quadrant, there's a tension. I think I should tell the truth. That is the ethical response. And yet my work, others work in this room and beyond suggest we don't follow through with that should in this quadrant. We often avoid these conversations and we lie within them. Right, so why do we do that? Uh, this is kind of where our current work comes in. And our main starting premise is that this tension between not wanting to cause immediate harm, but also feeling like you should promote value and growth to others, right, has the same psychological dimensions as other classic self-regulatory conflicts, right? They're kind of weighing this immediate visceral discomfort uh, with, that you associate with harm aversion against this kind of long-term future benefit of learning, growth, intimacy, and trust. And so uh, we can start with the idea that difficult conversations are experienced as a self-regulatory or want-should conflict, right? Concrete, visceral discomfort against long-term abstract benefit. And so if we begin with that assumption, we can then make some new predictions about well, what happens when faced with these difficult conversations? And then also, how can we promote honesty within them? Uh, so this is, I'll start to kind of, as we unpack and get into data, visualize our model, right? We begin with right, the idea that there is this conflict, this want-should conflict uh, between avoiding the costs, the visceral discomfort of immediate harm versus promoting the benefits of learning and growth. That leads to a pretty basic prediction that absence any intervention, immediate harm should loom larger in communicators' minds and kind of be what's driving their behavior. Just as we think in other self-regulatory domains, you know, the discomfort of going to the gym and getting sweaty like really biases me away from this long-term should of getting healthy and promoting growth, right? Similarly, when we think about engaging in these conversations, it's that immediate di visceral discomfort that looms large. Uh, so I'm just going to show you one a study that, that tests this. This was a, a study we ran last year where dyads came into our lab, uh, close relational partners. This was on Zoom, and they were randomly assigned to communicator and target roles, uh, and communicators had to give negative feedback to targets. And this is a design similar to, to studies Tia and I have done in the past. Uh, and we look at both predictions and experiences of the different consequences of difficult conversations. But for now, I'll just focus on testing this prediction of what is driving communicators' decisions. And we see, you know, when we consider all of the different uh, consequences, immediate and long-term kind of relational harm and benefits, we see what really is driving communicators' engagement intentions is expectations of kind of short-term harm. And so this perspective, though not super surprising if we know about kind of motivational conflict, it provides a different lens uh, on difficult conversations than I think a lot of recent work has, uh, has had. Uh, a lot of other work right, suggests that the barriers to social engagement, difficult conversations and beyond, is cognitive, that we don't understand the benefits of these conversations. We don't understand the benefits uh, of being kind or being truthful to other people and ourselves. So we find some evidence of that. There is kind of some disagreement where communicators don't recognize fully the benefits of these conversations. But beyond that, right, we also see that our communicators know they should engage. So they recognize the benefits. And even when we see them right, rate these conversations as very beneficial, they're not driven by that judgment. They're driven by the immediate social harm, right? Suggesting that independent of any knowledge or cognitive problem with how we think about these conversations, there's right, a fundamental motivational issue. Given that, uh, what we know about self-regulation suggests that psychological distance should help. If we can distance ourselves from that immediate visceral discomfort, we should enable ourselves and motivate ourselves to engage in these conversations more. So one form of distance we can think about is temporal distance, right? If I think about the future and plan my behavior in the future, am I more likely to engage right, than I would in the present? So we can test that uh, as well. We've, we've done a few tests of this. I'll just highlight one where people think about information that they currently know but haven't shared that could lead to a difficult conversation. Uh, those examples range from kind of negative feedback, voice, uh, and then whistleblowing, both in kind of personal and professional life. 
And we just asked people, right, if you had the opportunity to share this information now, what would you do? And if you had the opportunity in a month, what would you do? And we say, right, people intend to share in the future more than they intend to share it today. And we've done additional experiments where people plan out exactly what they're going to say, uh, suggesting that it's not just having more time to think about what you're going to say and plan for the conversation, but some aspect of you know, the temporal distance, thinking about the future, enables at least the intention right, to have the conversation. And so that leads to, well, what happens when later arrives, right? Just as you say, I'm going to go to the gym in a month, and then a month comes, and you still don't want to get sweaty, right? You should expect problems with follow through. Temporal distance creates the intention to engage, but when later arrives, right, we, we still are overwhelmed by, you know, the discomfort of harm aversion, right? So we would expect the same kind of problems with follow through as in other domains. So we'll talk about kind of commitment devices to solve that in a moment. But beyond that, there's a kind of a whole other re, right, a range of barriers in difficult conversations that are not common to other conflicts, which is that you can engage and then still succumb to the same biases that kind of failed to motivate you to begin with and lead you to communicate dishonestly within the conversation. So what I mean is, right, you could say, I'm going to, I'm going to, have this conversation with my boyfriend in a month. You get there, you, you, you start the conversation, but you're so overwhelmed by harm aversion, right? The, the discomfort, you then use evasive, misleading, or dishonest language, right? Which fails to realize the benefits of the conversation. Now, there's a parallel here to, to what we know about pro-social behavior uh, and charitable giving, where uh, if you feel too close to a person, you feel more averse to harm, uh, and that can bias you away from acting in the ways that do the most good. Right? So in the charitable giving case, it's, right, it biases you away from giving to the people who need it most. In this case, right, feeling empathy, closeness, harm aversion might bias you away from communicating honestly, even once you engage. And so we can think about right, conditional on engagement, you still face the second barrier, which is once I arrive, once we start talking, how am I going to actually get the words out in a truthful way? And we're suggesting that you need different forms of distance to motivate kind of this next part of truth telling. In particular, interpersonal distance, right? Kind of muting harm aversion, creating psychological distance from the target, which can be achieved in lots of different ways and is consistent with kind of past work. We could think about text-based communication versus voice kind of mutes. Uh, uh, interpersonal closeness creates distance, uh, having more distant relationships or right, being lower on kind of empathy and compassion right, also enables more truthful communication, conditional right, on the decision to engage. So right now, uh, uh, I was just focused on kind of the, the idea that text can enable more honest communication, which has been shown in, in some past work. Uh, but think about how we can combine these levers then to shape interventions, right? And this is uh, current work in progress, but I can tell you a little bit about some pilot data. Uh, but what we have in mind is these commitment plus interventions where you have an element of pre-commitment similar to other self-regulatory uh, commitment devices, right? You make a plan in the future and there's some penalty if you don't follow through with the plan. But also, right, these levers that create enough interpersonal distance to commit yourself to honest communication once you do engage. And so something simple as writing out what you're going to say first can help. Uh, and so we've been running some pilots. We're, we're getting ready to run the main intervention study with parents who want to have difficult conversations with their children about bullying, sex, racism, uh, eating disorders, healthy uh, body image issues. And we, we kind of describe these interventions to them so far, and we see the people opt in, right? They will engage in kind of costly pre-commitment, suggesting that there's an awareness, right, of these dynamics, that I know I should engage, I know I will be tempted not to, and so there is a demand for these type of self-control strategies. But we'll know uh, about that more hopefully soon. Um, so to summarize kind of this first part, and then I'll get into kind of the, the cross-cultural work we've been doing, uh, right, we're, we're positing that many difficult conversations are experienced as this tension between promoting the abstract long-term benefits of honesty versus causing the immediate discomfort associated with harm. 
Um, that kind of mirrors a classic self-regulatory conflict, uh, which influences both the decision to share the truth uh, and the decision to communicate honestly, conditional on sharing. Uh, temporal distance is uh, likely an effective uh, lever for increasing the intention to share, whereas interpersonal distance is a more effective lever for increasing honest communication. Uh, we also have a, a component of this that I, I don't have time to go into, but I'm happy to talk about in questions, in also thinking about how this same dynamic, the same self-regulatory conflict, influences your willingness to seek out the truth in the first place. So a uh, paper led by Benny, also with, with Taya and Mia and Will and Elizabeth, right? we introduced this, this new definition of honest behavior, which includes these three components. And so we can think also about how this temptation or discomfort associated with harm aversion influences right, both your willingness to find out information that could cause harm if you shared it, then your willingness to share that, and then to do so honestly. Um, we also have uh, some, some predictions about kind of how these levers influence the target's experience. Because I think what's an interesting, complicated uh, component is that when you create interpersonal distance, that enables honesty, but also right, might undermine the target's processing and experience of the conversation. And so balancing that uh, is important. Uh, so we hope that this model uh, can be useful for thinking about these conversations which are involved in many of our most important relationships. And there has been lots of literature looking at these different types of conversations, feedback, uh, negative news, uh, you know, discussions about racism, discussions about Santa, you know, these different, these different types of conversations. Um, but we're trying to unite them under kind of a common theoretical lens and think about the mechanisms that both lead to engagement, but also uh, honesty. Uh, and this, uh, we think, can help shed light on those first or one, two, and four research questions, read about what values are relevant, how are they experienced, and what can we do about it? What interventions might be successful? So I'm happy to, to answer questions on that at the end. I also just want to showcase what I think is maybe some, some messier work in progress that looks at kind of some of these ideas as they manifest in different cross-cultural contexts. And so when we started this work, we had like a very clear prediction about cross-cultural uh, honesty based on you know, some prior research and this uh, unnecessary harm model. And so if we look at research on cross-cultural communication, you often see, right, that in more collectivist cultures, there's more indirect language, there's more pro-social lying. Um, you, we certainly see this in the medical domain. There's more comfort and nuance, or less discomfort and more nuance around you know, deception at the end of life. And if we think about the uh, unnecessary harm model, we also might be led to believe that in collectivistic cultures, there should be more emphasis on social harmony and avoiding social harm. Whereas in individualistic cultures, maybe there'll be more emphasis on kind of autonomy and individual learning, right? So that was kind of the prediction we came in with. Uh, but I'll show you that it's very context uh, dependent. And so I, I think, you know, we need a broader understanding of how these language and honesty differences manifest within different contexts within culture. Um, so we looked at the context of medicine and feedback. I'm just gonna like highlight uh, a few snippets of what we found in each context. Uh, in the medical domain, we conducted a study with five different samples in both the US and China, of both physicians and non-physicians. And so uh, physicians were randomly assigned in China to imagine interacting with a male or female patient. In uh, the US, they were randomly assigned to interact with a male or female patient who was either Chinese American or white American. So also thinking about how our expectations of cultural differences influence communication within a single country. And then non-physicians in both countries were randomly assigned. We had Chinese adults, Chinese American adults, and white adults randomly assigned to imagine them in the surrogate, so like a loved one making decisions uh, versus the patient perspective. So participants, they evaluated a few clinical scenarios. I'm just gonna highlight the results of one. And here on the y-axis is the perceived or actual patient preference for honesty versus false hope, 
where higher numbers reflect a greater preference for honesty, lower for uh, lower numbers are preference for false hope. And this was a scenario about prognosis. So would you uh, want to know or have a kind of positively inflated perception of uh, your likelihood of beating a terminal illness? So this can start with patients, and we do see consistent with some past work, and I think the assumptions we often have in this space, that there was a greater preference for honesty among white uh, US patients, that's the blue here, versus Chinese patients. So significant greater preference for honesty in this medical context. Interestingly, this does not extend to Chinese American patients who are also uh, relatively high on collectivism. So it doesn't seem to extend uh, to Chinese American adults. More interestingly, I think, is what surrogates and, and physicians think patient preferences are. So we look at surrogates, we see across the board, they think patients want false hope, right? This is you just imagining what your loved one wants. They all think their, their loved ones want false hope, right? So there's this error among Chinese surrogates predicting Chinese patient preferences, uh, an even greater error among white US surrogates predicting white US patient preferences, uh, and then uh, an even greater error among uh, Chinese American surrogates predicting Chinese American patient preferences. And so across cultures, right, loved ones underestimate patient preferences for honesty, and doctors do it basically to the same extent. And so doctors are similarly, similarly miscalibrated, um, but comparing doctors to surrogates suggests that this is really a psychological perspective gap, right? This isn't the effect of being a doctor and whatever we think doctors have access to, right? Doctors and surrogates same general population, just randomly uh, assigned to think about the surrogate perspective, they end up coming to the same type of conclusion, which is that people want more false hope than they do. And so uh, we, we replicate these results in another clinical scenario. Um, I'm also happy to talk about kind of some other measures that we have uh, afterwards. But to sum up, we do see greater preferences for honesty among patients in the US versus China, uh, similar to, to past work and kind of public depictions of, of these ideas, but we also see that across cultures, communicators underestimate, both surrogates and doctors underestimate patients' preferences for honesty. And this is especially in the US and especially for Chinese American patients, right? It's highlighting how we might import kind of incorrect cultural information when trying to predict, right, the preferences of people different from us. Okay, so, so then will we find similar results in other domains, right? Will we see kind of consistent with what we often hear as rhetoric that there's less preferences for honesty in collectivist cultures? I'm gonna give you a spoiler that no, we won't. In the domain of feedback, things look very different. And so uh, in, in this study, I don't know if people remember, last year I presented uh, some data about feedback in lots of different domains. Competence-based feedback was particularly interesting in kind of showing this reversals of uh, kind of cross-cultural expectations. So that's what we've focused on here. Um, and I'll just give you a sense for, for one of these studies in which adults in the US and in China are randomly as, uh, assigned to a giver or receiver perspective and giving feedback about someone who needs to improve uh, kind of their, their work ethic. And so we, we measure the dimensions of unnecessary harm, both emotional harm, instrumental value, and communicators' intentions. Uh, and we see here, right, in the US, this is US versus Chinese givers, that communicators in the US think feedback will cause greater emotional harm. So this is inconsistent with the types of patterns we see in the medical domain uh, and in a lot of past work. Conversely, communicators in the US think feedback will have less instrumental value less lead to less learning and growth and communicators in the u.s are actually less willing to give feedback than communicators in china we can also look at the target perspective uh, we, we've replicated these effects um, in, in a few different uh, scenarios and we're running right now in-person dyads but turning to the target perspective we see that there's kind of a similar trend among targets where targets in the u.s think feedback will be more harmful to them they think it has somewhat less instrumental value. This is kind of a weak effect. And we can look at then miscalibration across cultures, and we see that uh, for emotional harm, 
kind of communicators overestimate emotional harm across cultures, although it is directionally stronger in the US. And communicators only in the US are underestimating the instrumental value of feedback. So in China, they're actually pretty well calibrated, which is a real result I have never seen. I've run a lot of these types of studies in different places in different contexts. Uh, and here they're calibrated. This is going to help this person learn and grow and targets believe that as well. But you still see kind of this error in the United States uh, context. And so uh, again, we, we see converse to the uh, effects in the medical domain that communicators in the US are less willing to speak honestly, to engage in these difficult conversations. And they're particularly miscalibrated about targets desire for negative feedback. So the only consistent part across the two studies and contexts is that communicators in the US were the most miscalibrated. Um, we're currently running kind of live dyadic studies. Uh, those are in progress. Our Chinese data is done, but we're still waiting on our US and Hong Kong data. And you could imagine, right, lots of different sources of differences in these domains, as well as kind of future steps to unpack what makes perhaps this domain of competence feedback uh, special. So just to wrap everything up, uh, difficult conversations are often experienced as these conflicts between harm, uh, social harm and honesty. Beliefs about the magnitude of harm, right, versus the benefits of honesty are both context dependent and culturally dependent, right? And those two things uh, interact. We have some other work looking at uh, just within the United States, different domains. And we also see things like moral feedback is seen as more harmful than non-moral feedback. So we can play with these dimensions to see where there's systematic variance um, that influences engagement. These conflicts, when they're experienced, have the same features of other self-regulatory conflicts, uh, which means that Psychological distance can be helpful for promoting honest conversations, but different forms of distance are useful for prompting engagement uh, versus honest expression. Uh, so there have been a lot of collaborators involved in different parts of this work. Um, I'm really grateful to all the, the feedback I've had from all of you over the years, um, both kind of through these conferences and informally. And yeah, I'm happy to discuss any questions. Um, I really like this a lot, and you know, your one of your early slides showed all the different opportunities for difficult conversations. I think this has a lot of applicability. Um, I noticed with your intervention, it had to do with avoiding the negative emotions, the visceral feeling that you talked about when it comes to, to delivering bad news or negative feedback. Um, did you consider, would you consider an intervention that would actually address the problem more directly. People are not comfortable having negative emotions. Um, and it just occurs to me, yeah. like there are therapeutic modalities that try to help people deal with their negative emotions, that sort of thing. And I think one of the benefits might be that some of the psychological distance um, interventions, which make perfect sense and may be very effective, they may not be very comforting to the target. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I'm just curious. Yeah. Right. So it's a super important point. And right, like this is also something that we struggle with in the model, which is right, psych interpersonal distance does undermine the target's experience. So I mean, this is kind of why we landed on this intervention where you write it out first, but then are present in the moment. But no, I have, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on other things to target like the emotional issue. The reason we didn't focus on it here is because it's right, it, it doesn't kind of draw on the mechanisms of the model. But one thing in particular we've been thinking about and done a little piloting on as well is um, reinterpreting your discomfort as a signal of care. So my colleague Ayelet Fishback has this beautiful work on kind of your own tolerance for negative information and how and challenge and how if you kind of reinterpret discomfort as a sign of growth, it motivates you to persist. And so in this interpersonal context, you can also think about, right, how can I reinterpret my, vi my discomfort with harming you as a signal that I care about you and channel that to promoting, right, your long-term growth. Um, I think, yeah, so I, I think that would be really interesting to, to kind of dive into. And I think yeah, in some other projects, there's a lot of, I think, room to, challenge people's assumptions about how fragile others are, right? Like that drives a lot of the barriers among these and in other contexts. Um, and so, yeah, dealing with that. Yeah. 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 Y
would be a great next step. This is obviously really cool. I'm curious about the cultural uh, data. You, in the, kind of in the setup, you talked about face and, and face cultures, and, and that. What strikes me about that is that it makes the implications or the, it, it could change the, the perception of the internal value of the feedback socially, right? So yeah. like in a culture in which face is really important and you, um, you know, it's really culturally defined, it becomes easier to imagine how the person could benefit from learning feedback um, and socially, right? So it might be more harmful, but one, one are you, okay, it's more harmful because they're receiving it and they're going to lose some face, but it's also, if they don't receive that feedback, they're even more screwed, right, because they can't, <coughs> they can't fix it. Yeah. And so the instrument of life um, might increase through the mechanism. I know you have different mechanisms, or at least not worded like I did, so I don't know if you would consider anything like that or yeah so so your prediction or kind of one explanation that you're toying with is in cultures where we care a lot about face we might think that these conversations like feedback are more harmful but they're more beneficial because i'm the only one willing to provide it right like because we know that otherwise they won't get provided or is right yes. yeah so if, they're, if they're not going to get the information otherwise more important, more important. Even, even though it might be more yeah. painful for them yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, we don't see, at least in the feedback context, that you know people, and again, this is so far just limited to China, so we're planning to do a, a bigger study across cultures, or like across multiple countries. Um, but they don't seem to expect that it's more harmful, right, either. And so I think there just you know, might be more specific norms in different contexts than right than when we just kind of paint a broad picture about like face matters right because you know also talking to the experience and also participants in these cultures like it's very common to give very direct negative feedback on appearance on your know, school work on professional things and so and that, that doesn't kind of match with our theory of kind of face face threat um but my colleague who's a Thomas, who's a cross-cultural psychologist and probably could speak to this better than I can, um, he's actually been doing a lot of beautiful work on responsibilism as kind of a new theory of collectivism, which is that it's about interpersonal duty in these cultures more than just face. And so if we think about it that way, right, duties are context dependent and we care about people, you know, fitting into the norms of the culture. Thanks so much for the talk. I didn't manage to uh, write this down quick enough, but on the right, the, the, there was the kind of doctor case where the information was kind of prognosis, and then the speed, when you were on the feedback case, there was like two changes. One was who you were imagining was giving the feedback, it was a friend, yeah. and then the other was what the content of the feedback was, with your work ethic. <laughs> I'm just wondering if the, it seems to me that the, both when I'm kind of imagining me as the target or me as the person giving feedback, the fact that it's my friend seems very yeah. live. And I, I just wondered if you'd done one where, like done a study where the content of the feedback was like more medical, it was just yeah. something like me, my work ethic. But I was either imagining giving feedback to a friend versus a kind of acquaintance versus a colleague, and then similarly yeah. moving on the receiving end from a friend and whether the prediction, whether I'm any, any better at predicting in that case. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we're currently running a study that's exactly that, right? Because actually feedback that came from last year, um, right? Hierarchy really matters, right? In collectivist cultures. And so this could be just a, you know, downward feedback has this, uh, these dynamics and peer to peer feedback, but we wouldn't expect kind of a willingness to give upward feedback in some more collectivist cultures. So right now we're running a study looking at personal versus professional and kind of uh, lateral versus hierarchical relationships of these dynamics. I don't have the, I don't have the data yet, but I, uh, I believe we share the same intuition. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, sorry. I, I, I might have just missed uh, the answer to this. Uh, so there's, I guess there's a, uh, you ask the, the person um, themselves as the target, uh, how, you know, um, their concern about the emotional reaction that they'll have if they're given honest feedback, and they say one thing. And then the, uh, the giver of the feedback uh, said, says, oh, no, don't, their emotional reaction be different. 
different than that. Um, do you, you do your studies speak to uh, whether the recipient, uh, the, the target or, or the, the giver is uh, more accurate about these predictions? Yeah, so we're, we're currently running live dyadic studies across, uh, across culture to answer that question. I mean, I can actually pull up this slide, but in the just US studies, we, we have you know, lots of data looking kind of across time who ends up being more accurate. Let me see. Um, and so kind of T and I have found these similar effects and so have others where kind of what you see is that communicators predictions a priori are usually miscalibrated and then once they engage they're actually pretty calibrated at least with the regard to harm. So it's not just a perspective difference that occurs. Um, it's kind of the, and this is kind of consistent with a self-regulatory perspective is that it's the approach, it's the discomfort I experience when I'm approaching the conversation that kind of elevates it in my mind. Once we do it, we're like, oh yeah, we're, we kind of recognize that that wasn't so bad and we're on the same page. And so we, we see that type of pattern. You know, over, over again. My follow-up was that was specifically with the patients um, because we've seen this generally where the communicators are the one mispredicting relative to the targets, um, but in your study with the doctors and the patients, you were relying on the patient self-report as the truth, right, and assuming everybody else was biased, and I guess that's based on this logic. Um, it'd be interesting to think about other indicators, specifically in that context, right, the patients really know what they want or need. Um, I think it's pretty realistic yes. to think they don't, but there is sort of a, yeah. a counter to that, that they're not calibrated well for themselves. Yeah, I mean, I. I think that's completely possible. I mean, right, there's, I've always wanted to do, right, like the live studies in medicine where, we, where you can't manipulate these things, but you can at least observe kind of what they think they want and how they react. I mean, my guess is it, it will look similar to kind of what we had seen over time, which is that you might see even on the target's perspective this temporal thing where you think it's going to be really, you think either you can handle it and then it's not so bad or you think it's going to be really bad and it's a little better. But over time, I think you, you know, everything we've collected suggests you acclimate, right, and you become more appreciative. And so it's also a question of, like, the preferences measured at what point in time should we consider as, like, a good normative stand. Thank you. Thank you.